Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast, and if that's you, welcome home. Today, I cannot believe I'm bringing you episode 100 of Military Murder. This show has grown tremendously in just the last four months or so. The show has been downloaded over two and a half million times worldwide, and the case suggestions are nonstop. The new folks here sometimes wonder why I focus on the bad apples, and I just want to remind everyone that I do this to remind our military and our non-military friends to remain vigilant. Life is short and we must cherish it, but we also have to keep our eyes peeled. If something feels weird, maybe it is weird. We have to trust our instincts. Today's case was recommended by our very own Myrtle. She's been helping me research and write cases for a few months now. And before I get into it, this case does require a backstory. When she told me the name of the perpetrator, I was like, okay, well, it's a 1993 case. There's not too much information out there. But then I saw the name of the victim and his name is Robert Lowry. He's an Air Force drag or he was an Air Force drag. And so I started to dig deeper because the name sounded very familiar to me. And then it hit me. The Air Force JAG School has an award named after Robert Lowry. It's called the Lowry Award. And after each incoming JAG class graduates, one of the students is awarded the Lowry Award. While I knew it was an excellent award, I never could have imagined that the award's namesake was the victim of a senseless murder. Myrtle did all the legwork on this case. She filed the FOIA, she wrote the script, and I read everything that she obtained. Over 300 pages of the file, including the 911 transcripts and the statements by security police, everything that we got. So let's get into it. Join me today as I tell you the tragic story of the murder of Major Robert Lowry. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this episode include documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, also known as a FOIA request. The documents that we received included documents from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, a statement from the Deputy Chief Air Force Press Desk, and articles in the Asbury Park Press, the Courier News, UptownPittman.com, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Airman Magazine. In the early afternoon of May 26, 1993, around 1.25 p.m., 911 dispatchers at the fire department on McGuire Air Force Base, they started receiving frantic calls that a man with a gun was seen inside building 1907 on base. Almost at the same time, the phone at the security police squadron law enforcement desk began to ring. It was a call to their direct line from a non-commissioned officer stating that they had just seen someone on the stairs in building 1907 with a gun in their hand. Security police officers advised the caller or the callers to get to an office and lock their door, then to try and call as many offices as they could to warn others about the gunman. The caller let the security police know that his coworker had already started warning people. Then another call came through. This time it was from someone in office 218 in building 1907, and that actually was the legal office. And the caller said that there was a gunman in their office and this person was demanding entry into the computer room. The security police desk sergeant told the caller to take cover behind his desk. They urged the caller to stay on the line with them and tried to calm this person down. The caller shouted that they could hear shots being fired and he started counting one, two, three, four, five, five, five shots and then continued until he lost count somewhere in the teens. During a lull in the shooting, the caller went to the door to see if the gunman was still in the office. He could hear the man saying, quote, if I don't get into the computer room, I'm going to pop someone, end quote. The caller then took cover behind his desk again. McGuire Air Force Base, the name of the base in 1993, is now known as Joint Base McGuire-Dix-Lakehurst. 
and it is located outside the town of Wrightstown in central New Jersey. The base is more than 38,000 acres large and is located roughly 30 miles east of Philadelphia. The primary mission of the base was, and still is, the airlift of military cargo and personnel. Building 1907 is a hulking four-story square windowless concrete and steel building located about a mile inside of the entry gates to the base. It was built during the height of the Cold War as an above-ground bunker, and it housed an air defense system in the 50s and 60s. At the time of this story, the structure had since been converted into offices that were used by different units on the base that included Headquarters 21st Air Force, so the building was often referred to simply as 21st. In the middle of the second floor was McGuire's Data Processing Center's mainframe system, a gigantic Spiri computer. The Data Processing Center was manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by members of the 438th Communications Group. The computer room was completely secure with motion sensors and steel doors that were alarmed. The main frame room, which was about the size of a small grocery store, was surrounded on all sides by a hallway and offices for the legal office, logistics, plans and programs, and more offices for the communications group around the outside. Building 1907 was built to withstand a direct attack from the air to keep the nation's defense system protected. In 1993, you know, the Cold War was over. But building 1907, well, on this day, it was under attack by an unknown threat that had simply walked through the doors. At around 1.15 that afternoon, 10 minutes before the first 911 call came in, a black Dodge pickup rolled up to McGuire's Gate 1. In those days, access to the base was granted either by displaying a current DOD sticker in your window or by showing your military or civilian employee identification card to the security police who was guarding the entrance. Well, this Dodge didn't have the necessary base decal on his window, but when the guard approached the driver, a black male in his 40s produced his retiree ID card. Sergeant, Air Force retired to be exact. When the police asked where he was going, the retired sergeant, whose name was Sergeant Leroy Swain Jr., he answered that he was going to the base exchange, which for those of you who don't know, is like a large department store located on military installations. Satisfied that the driver was authorized to enter the base, the security policeman stepped back and waved him through. Ten minutes later, Swain was creeping around inside building 1907. First, he went to the fourth floor and tried to shoot open a locked door. But when he was unsuccessful, he turned around and proceeded back down the stairs. A pair of non-commissioned officers, or NCOs as they're called, from the 438th Communications Group, they were bringing supplies up to their work center when all of a sudden they heard gunshots. Things then got quiet. So the NCOs figured it was probably an exercise of sorts and they started bringing in the supplies. As they got to the second floor landing, however, one of the NCOs noticed a man coming down the stairs towards them and he was carrying a brown paper sack and a gun. When the man, later identified as Swain Jr., asked them where the computer room was, the NCOs, they told him there, there wasn't a computer room on this floor. Of course, that was a total lie. The data processing center was part of their own unit. It made up nearly the entirety of the second floor, but you know, this lie bought them enough time for them to get back into their offices, lock the door and call 911. And one of them called 911 while the other started dialing all the different phone numbers, warning others to lock themselves in their offices. Then after this kind of interaction, the data processing center was quiet when suddenly the lone employee in the office, which was an older civilian woman in her 60s, she received a call. She answered and one of her coworkers asked to be let in. So she, you know, didn't have any issues. She nonchalantly got up. She went to the front door, but there was no one there. So she went to sit back down when she got another call. And she was told by one of the NCOs that had encountered Swain on the stairs that there was, quote, a guy running around with a gun, end quote. And then he ordered her to lock the doors. So she quickly got up. Mind you, she's like a 60 year old woman, but apparently she seems much older. And she got up, she's double checking all the doors, and then she hunkers down. And it turns out that the person who had called her to be let in the first time 
Well, he or she had been warned and they ran back to their office to lock down. An assistant staff judge advocate by the name of Major Robert J. Lowry was in an office in room 218 on the second floor of building 1907, and he was eating lunch with a coworker, a fellow major, when all of a sudden Leroy Swain Jr. entered the legal office reception area. Well, the two majors, they could overhear Swain asking the receptionist how he could get into the computer room. So they heard the man say that if he didn't get into the computer room, that he was going to, quote, pop someone, end quote. Now, the two officers got up from Major Lowry's desk because they were eating lunch in his office, and they went out into the outer office where they were met by a black man who was holding a gun and a brown paper sack. Now, the guy raised the gun in the air and then said, quote, want some of this, end quote, and then further said, quote, don't nobody go anywhere, end quote. The gunman pulled up his shirt and he started to reveal a large scar on his left shoulder. And then he began to repeatedly say that he had to get into the computer room. He also said he needed to get to the third floor to, quote, get his memory back, end quote. He looked at the two lawyers and asked them, quote, are you a relative of Bush, end quote. Now, the two majors, they knew something was definitely wrong with this guy. So they backed away into the office where Major Lowry told his colleague to lock the door and call 911. He then closed the office door behind him and headed out of the office. He was telling Swain that he had to leave because he was late for a meeting. Presumably, he was trying to lead Swain away from the rest of the personnel in the office, which, of course, included two civilian secretaries and an NCO. But Swain wasn't letting him go. Swain looked at Major Lowry and told him, you're not going anywhere. So Major Lowry then turned around and walked into his own office, again, away from where the other personnel were. The gunman followed him into the office and then he shot Major Lowry twice, once in the back of the head and once in the upper right side of his torso, causing the major to fall behind the desk. Meanwhile, the other major had already dialed 911 and the call was answered by dispatchers at the fire department. When they attempted to transfer the call to the security police, the call wouldn't transfer. You see, the security police had recently moved into a new facility and the phone lines weren't completely hooked up. Y'all, there was a gunman in the building, shots had been fired, and all the major could hear as he was trying to call for help was, Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory or the operator for assistance. McGuire Air Force Base Recording 1. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory or the operator for assistance. McGuire Air Force Base Recording 1. Your call cannot be completed. You, you get the picture. After an agonizing minute of the recording playing over and over again that must have felt like an eternity, the dispatcher was finally able to get the call over to the security police. As soon as they answered, the caller reported that someone had been shot. Meanwhile, the legal office secretary was able to run out of the office and get to one of the other offices where she placed another call to 911. And she told them, hey, listen, someone has been shot. Now, the dispatchers assured them help is on the way. At this point, security police had already been dispatched and activated their quick response checklist for snipers. Now, if you're thinking this is not a sniper situation, this is an active shooter situation. Listen, you're correct. But this is 1993 and active shooter drills were not a thing back then. At this point, sniper response was the closest training that security police had to handle the situation. Non-security personnel, they did their best to lock themselves inside offices and hide from the gunmen. Security police surround the building at this point and two police officers, Technical Sergeant Jim Pierpont, who had only been stationed at the base for a week, and his partner, Airman First Class Art Voss, they proceeded up to the stairwell to the second floor to confront the gunmen. As they moved towards room 218, they found several people huddled in their offices and the policemen there ordering them to evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. As soon as the police officers continued, though, they could smell gunpowder in the hallway near room 218, and they cordoned off the area. Inside the staff judge advocate's office, which, you know, is also called the legal office, Swain continued to talk erratically, stating, quote, they told me that this is what I would have to do. They told me I would have to do this, end quote. Tech Sergeant Pierpont called out to Swain, who answered with something to the effect of that they had been screwing with him for 20 years and he had to get it out of his head or out of his brain. Now, Tech Sergeant Pierpont knew there were hostages in the room and tried to get Swain out by engaging him in a conversation. And he's telling him, hey, come out, put the gun down. 
But Swain could be heard saying something about the damn computers and how they were screwing up his life. And he answered, quote, I mean business. I have already killed one. Come here and watch him bleed, end quote. Swain then stepped out of Office 218 and into the hallway. Tech Sergeant Pierpont ordered Swain multiple times to drop his weapon. But Swain answered, quote, don't aim that gun at me. Don't aim that gun at me, end quote. Tech Sergeant Pierpont responded, telling him, look, 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 I'm not aiming the gun at you. Put the gun down. But Swain ignored his orders, turned and raised his gun, pulling the trigger and shooting in the direction of Airman Voss. Tech Sergeant Pierpont then returned fire with his service weapon. He would later recall that he didn't remember hearing any noise. He just concentrated, focusing on his breathing and everything he had learned on the shooting range and in the classroom. As Swain continued to fire at the security policeman, Tech Sergeant Pierpont called out, he's still up, he's still up. And then he continued firing his weapon until Swain, boom, fell to the ground. But the gun was still in his clutches. When backup arrived and found Swain face down in the hallway, they ordered Swain to toss the gun, but there was no response. They approached Swain and removed the gun from his hand, and then they rolled him over, searching him for additional weapons, but none were found. So immediately they render first aid and emergency medical personnel were requested. 46-year-old Leroy Swain Jr. was pronounced dead at nearby Walson Air Force Hospital. Sadly, in the chaos of it all, Major Robert Lowry's body wasn't discovered until nearly 30 minutes after he had been shot and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Tech Sergeant Pierpont had fired his weapon a total of 12 times, hitting Swain eight times. When Swain's weapon, a Hungarian-made 9mm, was later unloaded, it was found that he had shot until he nearly emptied the magazine. It still had two bullets left in it, with one still in the chamber. 21 bullet jackets were recovered at the scene. Of those, 12 were confirmed to be from Tech Sergeant Pierpont, indicating the total number of shots that Swain took was nine, two that he shot Major Lowry with, and seven that he fired at the security police. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash Military Murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. So Myrtle, yes, our Myrtle who wrote this episode, she was the one that brought this case to me and she was a senior airman stationed at McGuire Air Force Base at the time of this shooting. And guess what? She worked in building 1907 in the base communication center, the same place where Swain was trying to get into. Myrtle and her boyfriend at the time, who worked on the fourth floor, had left the building around 12.45 p.m. to grab some lunch. And they were floored when they returned to the building to see that it was entirely blocked off by security police vehicles. But not only them, there were fire trucks, ambulances, 
and they all were there with like their lights flashing. As they approached the building, they assumed that this was an exercise. So they approached the barricade where the other military personnel had been standing because they had been evacuated or they were just getting back to the building from lunch. And as Myrtle and her boyfriend listened to the different conversations and they observed the emergency responders trying to figure out what exactly was happening inside, they could hear the sound of gunshots over a security police vehicle's radio. And then they heard the announcement that the gunman was down. Myrtle, as she told me this story, it, it, it was just surreal. They had just returned from a deployment to Somalia the month before, and they weren't prepared for the sound of gunfire. Definitely not at their home station in the building where they worked. In the year following the shooting, when Myrtle moved to her next base, she says that despite the walls being repainted and the carpet replaced, the walls in building 1907 bore the pockmarks from the bullets leaving a permanent reminder of the tragedy that occurred on the second floor. So who was the lone gunman who wrecked havoc on building 1907? Leroy Swain Jr. was born on June 9, 1946. He joined the Air Force in 1962 and spent approximately six years in Vietnam refueling aircraft. According to his father, he came home at one point during the war. He re-enlisted and was sent back to Vietnam. When he returned from his second deployment, his father noted that the younger Swain was a different man and said that he had, quote, head problems, mind problems, end quote. Swain Jr. was medically retired from the Air Force in 1968 and moved in with his father in Chester, Pennsylvania. Over the years after his retirement, he had made several visits to veterans hospitals for psychiatric problems. Swain was arrested in 1984 for theft by deception unlawful use of a computer and passing bad checks after a Chester bank filed complaints against him. But he never showed up for the trial for those charges and he was listed as a fugitive. On March 2, 1993, Swain Jr. was charged with harassment, disorderly conduct, and making terroristic threats following an incident in Delaware. A psychiatric exam was ordered by the court on March 8th, but the charges were later dropped just eight days later on March 16th. A month before the incident on McGuire Air Force Base, Swain purchased the Hungarian Model 9mm from an Air Force retiree in Delaware. Yes, the same gun he used in the shooting. Well, Swain had told the seller that he wanted the gun for target practice. The shooting on May 26 wasn't the first encounter that the 438th Security Police at McGuire Air Force Base had with the retired Sergeant Leroy Swain Jr., a few weeks before the shooting on Sunday, April 18, 1993, Swain Jr. paid a visit to Building 1907. But since it was a Sunday, it was locked. Swain Jr. instead gained access to the Base Communication Center, which is a separate structure located right outside of Building 1907. But Swain didn't get far because although the front door was open, it only allowed him access to the foyer. Inside the foyer, Swain was faced with a second locked steel door and a one-way glass window with a narrow slot below it where communication center personnel, they would pass copies of secure messages to couriers who came to pick them up. I mean, this is long before email, y'all. So the staff sergeant on the other side of the glass asked the man who was Leroy what he needed and Swain responded that he needed to get in because the satellite receiver was, quote, talking to his head, end quote. That was when the NCO was like, mm, this ain't right, and called security forces because she wasn't even going to try to deal with this guy at this point. When security forces arrives, Swain told them that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. The responding police officer ordered Swain to leave the area, and since he followed their orders, no further action was taken. On May 12th, Swain showed up again. This time, security forces got a call from the base's senior enlisted advisor. The senior enlisted advisor is now known as a command chief and is the highest enlisted person on the installation. Now, he had noticed a black male roaming the base and he was last seen near the base's bulk fuel storage tanks. Now, these aren't small fuel tanks. These are a group of massive tanks that hold jet fuel for the base's flying mission. But listen, by the time the security forces showed up, the man was long gone. While it has not been confirmed, it is assumed that this was Swain. And guess what? Five days later, Swain was at it again. 
Late in the evening on May 17, 1993, security forces were again summoned to respond to Swain, who was reportedly acting mentally unstable. He told responding officers that, quote, there is something illegal going on over at the 21st because I feel vibrations traveling through my body, end quote. Now, remember, the 21st is what personnel called Building 1907. Security forces transported Swain to the law enforcement desk, which is basically the police station on post, on base, and requested New Jersey State Police Patrol to take Swain into custody. But the New Jersey State Police, they were unable to respond because of low manning. Military police start processing Swain, and at one point, Swain requested medical attention because he said he had forgotten to take his medication. So medics arrive at the law enforcement desk, but when they tried to examine Swain, he was like, no, 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 no. I will only be touched by VA, meaning that the veterans hospital, he only allowed the veterans hospital to touch him. Well, about an hour after he had been detained, Swain was released on his own reconnaissance and escorted off base. After the shooting at McGuire Air Force Base, Swain's picture, of course, was plastered all over the news and newspapers. And well, two NCOs who worked admin in Building 1907 Well, they recognized Swain as the man who had come to their offices on either the 24th or the 26th, asking for directions to the computer room. They said that the guy was carrying a brown paper bag with him at the time. Well, these troops hadn't reported it because at the time he had complied with their orders to leave the building. Swain Jr. had run-ins with the Chester, Pennsylvania police as well. As after the shooting, the Chester PD noted that they had a blotter entry about Swain saying he had, quote, satellite talking to his head, end quote. The investigation also revealed that Swain had been admitted to the hospital in January of 93 for an undiagnosed mental disease. At a use of force review board on June 2nd, 1993, the board unanimously felt that the actions of Tech Sergeant Pierpont and Airman Voss, the responding security policemen, they were justified according to Air Force regulations and local policy directives. In 1995, then Master Sergeant Pierpont was awarded the Airman's Medal, which is the highest non-combat honor that can be awarded by the Air Force. 21 years after the shooting at McGuire, Jim Pierpont was interviewed by his hometown newspaper, the Uptown Pittman, about his heroic actions stopping Swain from killing more people in 93. Pierpont said there was a lot to process in the aftermath of the shooting. He had to deal with the press and the stigma of being the one who ended Swain's life. People didn't know how to approach the subject with him, and even though they wanted to talk to him about it, they just didn't know how he was handling it. He got through it with the help of military chaplains and counselors, as well as private therapists, And Pierpont was quoted in the interview as saying, quote, there are other people I'd classify as heroes before I said it about myself. There are heroes that walk among us every day. I'm not that guy, end quote. The Airman's Medal and accompanying certificate were stored in a chest at his mother's house since he received it and he did not put it on display. He went on to say, quote, you have to understand this was a small snapshot in a 20 year career, end quote. During the later years in his career, he would show new police officers the hallway where he earned his medal. Each time he found they were respectful and took him seriously. He'd tell them, quote, if you want to learn, I'll tell you. If you just want the drama, I have no time for you, end quote. When asked how it changed him, he replied simply, quote, it's made me appreciate things a little more. How cool would it be if we all spoke a little softer, smiled a little more, helped each other, end quote. Oh, I just love this guy. The humility of a true hero is just something out of this world. In researching for this show, I have found that the true heroes, they rarely consider themselves that. They almost always say, hey, I was just doing my job. And that's true. Sergeant Pierpont, if you ever listen to this, I just want to say thank you for your service. Sergeant Pierpont and his wife, Rhonda, they lived a quiet life with their three children after he stepped away from the Air Force career in 1998. They retired to Pittman, New Jersey, where he and his wife ran a stationary store. As of 2016, he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, the VFW, and a councilman for the borough. He sadly reflected on thoughts of Major Larry's family. 
he also knew that Swain left behind his father and said he prayed for both families. Major Robert Lowry was born on April 8, 1955, in Nashville, Tennessee. Bob Lowry was one of five children, and his father was a renowned judge advocate for the Air Force. His father's name is Joseph Lowry, and he ultimately retired as a brigadier general. Since his father was in the Air Force, they lived all over the world, including the Philippines and Germany. Major Lowry was a part of the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps at Notre Dame. He graduated with a Bachelor's of Business Administration and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Air Force in 1977, which was the same year that his father was promoted to Brigadier General. After serving on active duty for three years, Bob was accepted into the funded legal education program and he went to law school on the Air Force dime, which, by the way, is an amazing program for any of my military officer listeners who are interested or considering law school. So Bob earned his law degree from the University of Tennessee in 1983. Major Lowry had been stationed at McGuire Air Force Base for about two years at the time of his murder. Prior to McGuire, he had been stationed at Keesler, Andrews, Wright Pat, Shaw, Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado, and Randolph and Lackland Air Force Bases in Texas. His awards at the time included the Air Force Commendation Medal with two oak leaf clusters. He was a director of civil law at the headquarters 21st Air Force at McGuire when he died. In a letter from Colonel John R. Brancato, the 21st Air Force staff judge advocate, he stated, quote, Major Bob Lowry was a genuinely good person, a human being of the first magnitude and an exceedingly effective judge advocate. I have never met anyone who knew him who did not like him a lot. He had a sense of humor, a winning grin, a perspective mind, and he was a good writer and a crisp briefer. He also was a natural athlete, having wowed several hundred people with his speed, agility, power, and stamina in a recent headquarters field day and a more recent softball game. He loved cars. He was a family man, a loving husband, a gentle father, a devoted son, and a loyal brother. My wife told me she never knew anyone as madly in love with each other as Bob and Linda Lowry, end quote. He went on with a bit of levity saying, quote, I asked Bob to bring me back some Portuguese cheese from his recent TDY to Lodge's field. And he did so with great laughter on return because his uniform smelled of ripe cheese, end quote. He ended the letter stating, quote, Major Bob Lowry died honorably, innocently, courageously in uniform while serving the country that all of us serve, end quote. Major Robert L. Lowry was only 38 years old when he was gunned down in his office. He left behind his wife, Linda, and his daughter. He was posthumously awarded the Meritorious Service Medal and was laid to rest with military honors in the National Cemetery in Dayton, Ohio. In the years following his death, the Air Force Staff Judge Advocate named an academic award after Major Lowry. According to an Air Force spokesperson, quote, The Lowry Award is named in honor of Major Robert L. Lowry, an Air Force judge advocate who was shot and killed in 1993 while safeguarding clients and staff from a deranged gunman in the 21st Air Force Legal Office at McGuire Air Force Base. The award was established by Major Lowry's family and is presented to the Judge Advocate Staff Officer Course student who best exemplifies the highest standard of leadership, academic excellence, officership, esprit de corps, and service before self, end quote. Wow. 12 years ago, when I was going through the JAG school, I never could have imagined a story like this. It seems kind of fake, but it's real. Truly makes me appreciate my fellow comrades just a little bit more. It also makes me respect the Lowry Award so much more because truly, Major Lowry was just eating his lunch on a Wednesday afternoon when the trajectory of his life and his family's life changed forever. He allowed another fellow Jag the opportunity to lock himself in his office while he distracted a crazy gunman. Also, to all the military police in all branches, thank you so much for your service. I imagine the job can seem mind-numbing on a daily basis, But really, you are the ones keeping the installations safe. True Crime Army, make sure you're following me on social. I do weekly military true crime snippets on TikTok at Military Margot with a T at the end. 
And my backup to TikTok is Instagram, which is Military Murder Podcast. A special thanks to Myrtle for teaching me something new this week and of course for this amazing episode. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions. Executive producers are Falcon 13, Nicole, Jen, Ryan, Tina, and Alicia. My newest associate producers are Tiana, Renee, and Crystal. And my newest assistant producers are Steph D, Kirsten, Joanna, Melanie, and Madeline. Shout out to the fan club members who committed to supporting the show for an entire year. Thank you to Jen, Siomara, Cherise, Steph D, Brandy, Megan, Luann, Amy, and Lynn. Also, thanks to my new supporters, Carney, Cassandra, Morgan, Brittany, Diana, Mr. JG, and Amara. If you would like to support the show and become a producer of sorts, check out the fan club today at patreon.com slash military murder to see how you can support the show. The music on this show was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Working on our podcast. I don't want to.